And thank you. Um, uh, Christian Lieber, please. Thank you. So we'll, we'll do a two part here. I'll sort of set the scene and then uh, Ms. McNaughton is going to explain specific recommendations that we have. I have copies of these and I've also submitted them to the committee uh, for translation, but I'm happy to circulate the documents. So we here. should have you go first, Ms. McNaughton second, Correct. and then we'll go back to civil liberties. Correct. Okay, good, thank you. So I think we need to ask ourselves why we are here. And I think one of the challenges that we've had is we hear a lot of tactics, but we don't hear a lot of what's the strategy and what's the ultimate rationale behind this. And the rationale is that as Canadians, we've long lived in an environment where we believe that we have been safe by virtue of where we are in the world, which is very far away from all the troubles in the world. And I would submit that this is no longer the case, that the fundamental conditions have changed that the security threats and vectors are much broader and much deeper than they have ever been. If you think about um, hypersonic maneuverable cruise missiles, you think about intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, you think about the cyberspace, you think about um, violent extremism, terrorism, uh, ideology, but you also think about matters such as the globalization of, uh, of organized crime. And so these are all things that we can't just keep away from our borders. They affect us here now and they affect us every day. So the, the, the security environment has fundamentally changed that the premise of we're somehow safe because we're far away from the troubles in the world simply no longer applies. We've also, of course, seen these threats specifically associated with certain entities. This is often what's referred to as the four plus one issue. So four countries, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, and the plus one is, the, is transnational, um, transnational terrorism. In Canada, we don't have a systematic uh, human foreign intelligence service, so we rely disproportionately on our signals intelligence service to provide us the foreign intelligence that we need in order to get uh, domain awareness. We also have the benefit of being part of the Five Eyes community, and this membership should not be taken lightly. There is an international security hierarchy in the world. If you think about this as a pyramid, the United States at the top and the Five Eyes community below that. And that means we need to be able to continue to be effective contributors to that community if we want to benefit from that community. The benefit from that community has precisely been that we have been able effectively to underinvest relative to most of our allies in in defense, in security, in intelligence, because we have this force multiplier, uh, because we have this force multiplier capability of domain awareness and overcoming the fallacy of composition that we wouldn't otherwise have. And so we need to balance here our obligations and the benefits to that community with the constraints that we impose on our own community. We've also seen a fundamental change in the intelligence business as a result of two uh, of two events, if you want. One is the advent of the internet and of large data. And it means not just that the bad guys have been exploiting those systematically. And I would submit that in Canada, we have been a little bit too uh, easy on the bad guys who exploit the internet and data and too hard and make, it, make life a little bit too difficult for the people who are actually trying to disrupt, um, rein in, detect, and defend us against these, uh, against these nefarious entities. So we need to strike a balance between, if you want, the good guys and the bad guys. And of course, the advent of 9-11 has fundamentally changed the intelligence community and also the expectations that the public has of the state in terms of keeping them safe and secure. And more than ever before, in light of the threats that I've outlined, we are relying on intelligence to help us anticipate the security and safety challenges for Canada and to be able to mitigate um, those challenges effectively. My fourth and final submission on this point is that as a result of the Snowden revelations, uh, much of the public has uh, some skepticism about how the community operates. We are not here because there is in any way some large-scale violation by the professionalism or the capabilities in which the community does its job. We have the odd issue that comes up. Usually those issues are first identified by the community itself and then brought to the appropriate offices. So we have a professional community. 
Um, but we have the public that is skeptical, and so I think the primary purpose of review here is to reassure the public that every, in a rule of law society and in a constitutional society, everything is indeed on the up and up. The other problem is we have a massive public misunderstanding of what the community does, why it does it, and how it operates. And that's as a result of the media, because where we see the community operate is largely on, on television, where we have shows about law enforcement, intelligence, terrorism, and whatnot. And if you watch those shows, the systematic violations of the rule of law and of constitutionalism, it makes for great television, but it is simply not how the community operates. But this is what most Canadians and much of the public thinks is happening, reinforced by some of the way that the revelations by Edward Snowden have been interpreted and misinterpreted in much of the, uh, of the public discourse. I would also say we need to be careful then in Canada with the security culture that we've created. On the Five Eyes community, we have by far the most restrictive privacy regime. This is a choice that we have made as Canadians. But what we're doing here is we're we need to balance this with so other countries that have very more rigorous parliamentary and other review mechanisms that Canada has have also given their community more latitude in terms of how it can act, what it can do, and how it can do it. And so in Canada, I'm a little concerned that on the one hand, we're imposing considerable constraints on the ability of the community to be agile and flexible to continue to reassure the safety and security of Canadians, while at the same time imposing this very strict uh, review regime, which yes, is necessary to reassure the public, but we need to make sure we strike an an effective, uh, an effective balance here. And so I hear lots of people constantly talk about privacy, as if review was only about privacy, which of course is nonsense. There's review, there's oversight, yes, there's compliance review, but review is also about efficacy, so are Canadians actually getting what they pay for from the community? Currently, nobody is actually really able to ask that question, and we will now, as a result of these mechanisms, have the ability to ask those questions. And Effectively, these committees will also be peer review for the community. Are they doing the best job they possibly can with the best methods and the best approaches that are available to them? So this discussion that is simply about privacy, to me, is misconstrues the broader benefits and payoffs of a more robust um, review regime by parliamentarians um, and by a, the, the now revised uh, community of, uh, of, of review bodies that will have a broader remit uh, overall. So I'll close on six questions that we need to ask ourselves when we try to introduce this type of legislation. What are the methods that should be used to hold the intelligence and security agencies to account? What ISAs, what intelligence and security agencies should fall in the remit of those accountability bodies? Who is staffing those accountability bodies? Um, what relationship does the accountability have the ability, uh, accountability body have with the political executive? Uh, to what information does the accountability uh, body have access? Uh, and is there more than one accountability body? How do they coordinate and how do they prevent duplication? And this dovetails now with Ms. McNaughton's recommendations that uh, follow directly from some of these issues that we have laid out here that people need to think about uh, when we implement such legislation. You have about two minutes left. So to enhance intelligence accountability, we have suggested five recommendations. The first, um, Bill C-59 does not describe if and how NSERA, which is the National Security and Intelligence Review Agency, uh, will support the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. Um, in the existing system, the Committee of Parliamentarians could apply to OCSEC, the Office of the CSC Commissioner, or the Security Intelligence Review Committee, or the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission if they needed um, additional assistance. However, if Bill C-59 is passed, they will only be applied to NCR, NCR or the CRCC. Um, in, in regards to this recommendation, we consider um, how much support NCR will give the, um, the Committee of Parliamentarians and what kind of support they will give the Committee of Parliamentarians. The second suggestion is that the Civilian Review and Complaints Commission um, should retain its ability to review issues and investigate complaints related to national security. Um, this is related to uh, the existing legislation giving NCR the ability to review national ma matters related to national security issues goes against the recommendations from the O'Connor Commission. Also, in the end, it would give CRCC um, undue influence over the um, the what NCR reviews in regards to national security because NCR will remain the principal point of contact for the complaints and reviews, um, which it would then refer, refer, um, refer to NCR. 
uh, the third recommendation, and Sarah should have the ability to conduct joint investigations with provincial police and complaint bodies. Um, the CRCC has this power as well. Basically, a lot of the federal intelligence and security agencies um, in their work, uh, they work with provin uh, provincial police bodies, so that is also a consideration. Uh, NCR should develop and establish standards for intelligence accountability. And lastly, NCR should take reasonable steps to cooperate with the Committee of Parliamentarians to avoid unnecessary duplication of work in relation to the fulfillment of their respective mandates. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and uh, BC Civil Liberties, I assume you're ready. Yes, my apologies to the committee for coming in late. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association appreciates the opportunity to make submissions with respect to Bill C-59. CCLA was a vocal critic of the Anti-Terrorism Act passed in the last session of Parliament and initiated a constitutional challenge to a number of aspects of that law, which remains in abeyance pending consideration of Bill C-59. While this new bill has partially addressed some of Bill C-51's constitutional deficits, it has certainly not resolved all of them. The bill also grants our national security agencies a number of extraordinary new powers that have not been adequately justified and that do give rise to very real civil liberties concerns. The government has framed this bill as being about both protecting national security and rights. CCLA supports both of these goals, and our comments and recommendations are made in that spirit. Well, we, we will begin by identifying the positive changes C-59 makes to former Bill C-51, outline the issues that remain unaddressed, and finally, set out the new problems created by C-59. Since we certainly can't cover everything in 10 minutes, we'll also be filing a more detailed written submission. Beginning with the items that C-59 has improved, we are reassured by the government's amendments to the terrorist speech offences. Without these amendments, the provisions violate sections 2 and 7 of the Charter, and may also undermine community-based de-radicalization efforts. While the amended offense is arguably unnecessary, given the large number of pre-existing terrorism offenses in the criminal code, counseling offenses are a known quantity in the criminal law and follow a clear legal framework. However, the language of terrorism offense in the amendment would be better changed to terrorist activity, which is a defined term in the code. On information sharing, Bill C-59 adds new proportionality and reporting requirements which is a distinct improvement over the largely unaccountable system introduced in Bill C-51. However, the definition of threats to the security of Canada that triggers information disclosure remains unduly broad and circular. It is not clear why this definition is so much broader than the one included in the CSIS Act, and we remain concerned that constitutionally protected acts of advocacy, protest, dissent, or artistic expression, particularly by environmental and Indigenous activists, will continue to be swept up in the process. One of the most controversial aspects of Bill C-51 was the threat reduction powers granted to CSIS and the accompanying warrant provisions, which appeared to allow for judicially sanctioned charter breaches. We do not doubt that there are times when CSIS may see an opportunity to take action to reduce the threat to the security of Canada. What is unclear is why better communication and cooperation between CSIS, the RCMP, and other law enforcement bodies is incapable of achieving this goal. This is a very significant shift in mandate that appears to ignore the historical reasons for separating law enforcement and intelligence in the first place, and there has been no convincing case made out for why this shift is necessary. Moreover, the legal framework for the exercise of these powers established in Bill C-51 was deeply problematic and clearly unconstitutional in our view. The scheme as modified by Bill C-59 is an improvement. It establishes clearer contours around what actions are permitted and what is prohibited, and the warrant scheme appears to be intended to ensure that the charter rights of individuals are respected. If CSIS is to continue to have these powers, there are a number of ways in which we believe the scheme should be improved. First, the requirement for CSIS to consult with other federal departments or agencies to see if they can reduce the threat should be amended to clarify that if a law enforcement body is better placed to do so, CSIS should not pursue threat reduction. Second, the list of measures set out in proposed section 21.1, subsection 1.1, only require a warrant where CSIS determines that they may violate the law or limit a charter right. A warrant should be required in any case where these measures will be pursued by CSIS. It is vital that the determination of whether a law is being violated or a charter right limited is not left solely to CSIS. 
Finally, the new National Security and Intelligence Review Agency should be required to report on the number of warrants issued under Section 21.1 and the number of requests that were refused. CERC does so now, and reducing reporting requirements is not consistent with C-59's stated goal of enhancing accountability. Some of the most problematic aspects of C-51 received only cosmetic improvement or none at all. As this committee is aware, the Passenger Protect Program continues to raise serious constitutional problems. The process by which individuals are placed on the list remains opaque, and proposed redress mechanisms are inadequate. Bill C-59 also fails to correct the flawed appeals procedure, which parallels the system in place for security certificates prior to the Supreme Court's Charkawi decision in 2007. While the no-fly list is undoubtedly different than being named in a security certificate, both have the ability to substantially interfere with the constitutionally protected rights and liberties of an individual and to seriously impact their lives and families. The current process allows the use of hearsay and secret evidence without access to a special advocate able to test that evidence or to represent the interests of the listed person. This committee, this committee recognized these profound issues in May when it recommended the use of special advocates in no-fly list proceedings, among other safeguards, and yet Bill C-59 does not address these concerns. It should do so by adopting this committee's initial recommendation. We would note that the terrorist entities list raise similar issues. Mr. Chair, another deeply problematic aspect of Bill C-51 that has not been touched in this bill are changes to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, which undid important protections for named persons in security certificate proceedings. C-51 limited the requirement for disclosure of relevant information to special advocates and introduced a series of procedural barriers which further disadvantaged the rights of the named person. In our legal challenge, CCLA has argued that these amendments are an unconstitutional violation of the Section 7 guarantee to a hearing before an independent and impartial tribunal. And our Supreme Court has affirmed that the individual named in a security certificate must be given an opportunity to know the case to meet and an opportunity to meet that case, unquote. An impossible exercise in the absence of a coherent legal framework for full disclosure. This committee recognized as much in May 2017 when it recommended amending IRPA in order to give special advocates full access to complete certi security certificate files. We urge that C-59 be amended to correct this issue. We move now to the new elements of the national security landscape that C-59 has introduced. Our written submission will address a much wider range of issues in relation to the CSE Act, but we would like to highlight two parts today. First, the proposed active and defensive cyber operations aspects of the CSE's mandate essentially allow the establishment to engage in secret and largely unconstrained state-sponsored hacking and disruption. The limitation of not directing these activities at Canadian infrastructure is clearly inadequate, given this inher the inherently interconnected nature of the digital ecosystem. Such activities are also bound to impact privacy, expression, and security interests of Canadians and persons in Canada, and may threaten the integrity of communications tools such as encryption and anonymity software that are vital for the protection of human rights in the digital age. In the case of CSIS's disruption powers, which are in some ways analogous to these new aspects of CSE's mandate, the government has set out a complex framework for prior judicial authorization and a longer list of prohibited activities. While we do not concede the adequacy of that framework, it is notable that in contrast, CSE's cyber operations activities involve no meaningful privacy protections, require only secret ministerial authorization, and involve only after-the-fact review. Second, while the majority of CSE's activities cannot be directed at Canadians or persons in Canada, this is an inadequate safeguard against CSE's overreach in the face of unselected bulk collection. Bill C-59 exacerbates this privacy risk by creating a series of exceptions for the collection of Canadian data, including one which allows the acquisition, use, analysis, retention, and disclosure, so long as it is publicly available. This definition is so broadly defined that it plausibly includes information in which individuals have a strong privacy interest and potentially allows for the collection of private data obtained by hacks, leaks, or other illicit means. Furthermore, it may encourage the creation of gray markets for data which would otherwise have never been available to government, a client with deep pockets. The government has failed to demonstrate why this exception is worded as necessary or proportionate, uh, nor what risk is meant to mitigate in the first place. The CS yeah? I appreciate the time is the enemy here, <laughs> um, but... Um, you're speaking so quickly that the oh, interpreters are having apologies. difficulty keeping <laughs> up. So um, if we could just slow it down just a sec. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> 
Thank you. So the government has failed to demonstrate why this publicly available uh, information exception is worded as necessary or proportionate, nor what risks it's meant to mitigate in the first place. The CSE has identified a need to access reports on the global infrastructure as a justification for this provision, yet a more narrowly defined list of information types would easily respond to such a need. Um, while Section 7 specifies that privacy must be considered, the nature of the protection is vague, the regulations setting out the scope of protection are likely to be secret, and the potential for invasive information collection and abuse is high. In the CSIS Act, the parallel term, publicly available data set, remains undefined, but appears to replicate the same types of problems. Finally, we welcome the new accountability mechanisms in C-59 and strongly support the creation of the new integrated review body and the introduction of an intelligence commissioner with the ability to exercise quasi-judicial oversight. However, we are concerned that significant gaps remain. The commissioner only issues reasons when rejecting an authorization. The reasons are kept secret from the public. There is no adversarial input. The authorizations will continue to be issued on a class basis. And there is no framework for appeal or review of decisions except by the minister and intelligence agencies themselves. Without amendments that strengthen the role of the commissioner, their ability to exercise meaningful oversight and control will be limited in practice. We welcome questions from the committee about these issues and other aspects of Bill C-59. Thank you uh, very much. And um, uh, the first question, or the first uh, question is Mr. Fragiscatos. Um And I just think the issue is kind of joined here with this uh, uh, panel, and so if there is a uh, a will on the part of one of the other persons uh, wishing to uh, respond, uh, you might get the attention of the questioner or of myself so that they can engage. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all of you for being here today. My first question goes to uh, Mr. Leuprecht and, and Ms. McNorton. Uh, in a recent Toronto Star piece, you uh, noted that uh, the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians um, lacked a, uh, among the members that have been appointed, lacked a security uh, background. Uh, there are s some members that have a, some experience in the, in the realm of security, but by and large you said that uh, there was a lack of experience and expertise. But I think you would agree that there is something to be said about an outsider's perspective, on the condition, of course, that there is uh, advisory opportunity and uh, to be uh, in the form of a secretariat uh, to, uh, to assist in the work and provide information and that, that kind of expertise and background. You would agree that that's a, that's a necessary thing. Look, I think one of the strengths of parliamentarians is that they're generalists and that they okay. have to deal with wide ranges of legislation, but my concern is to, that there is a lot of dis and misinformation in this particular realm and it can be very difficult to understand because mm -hmm. most people have not worked in the actual community no. and don't understand. So Point taken. I just wanted to, to offer that idea because I think, well, we're on the same page. There is something to be said about an outsider's perspective. Uh, staying with the Committee of Parliamentarians, uh, you have argued and others have argued, uh, for example, Professor, Professor Wesley Wark, who we heard from just the other day, that this committee will need a research and advisory support in the form of an independent secretariat. But the question is, where should the um, experts be drawn from? Uh, for example, uh, Wesley Wark says the following, and I'll just quote him for you. Uh, are they too close to the security and intelligence community? Are they, go are they going to be too palsy, too much a defender of the security and intelligence community? Is that a concern that you have? Is that uh, Go into that, if you could, because I, I think it's an interesting point. Look, there's always trade-offs, but I think the expertise uh, is critical for the committee to ask the right questions and to be able to know what information to ask for from the, uh, from the community. And I would also submit that, I mean, what we propose is people, for instance, who have, are done with their career, who have retired, so they have nothing at stake, per se, uh, in, the, uh, in the overall undertaking. Um, uh, but these are folks who have decades of careers as professionals. So, uh, and I think the, um, there are, um, uh, this is among, if, if there is a community in the country that takes both their job and the need to absolutely respect the law 100% every time, absolutely serious. It is the security and intelligence community federally, provincially, and locally in this so country. You don't see a, a danger in, in the same way that Professor Work does then, that there perhaps would be too much of a, a close relationship 
uh, as he says, are they too close to the security and intelligence community to offer um, the kind of independent uh, advice and analysis that would be necessary for the parliamentarians to carry out their work? So there is a precedent set with some of the um, existing intelligence um, accountability bodies that do hire um, uh, employees who have experience with the intelligence and security agencies in Canada and then they as far as I know have not had a problem with it. Additionally there are also tests that can be employed to test the loyalty of um, employees. Okay. Uh, would the Civil Liberties Association have a view on that? Sorry, I don't think we have a comment. Okay. Uh, again to uh, Professor Leuprecht and Ms. McNaughton. You point out that there is a fear, or you have a fear of overlap, overlap of work between uh, the Committee of Parliamentarians and the NSIRA. Could you go into that in greater detail? Uh, yeah, so considering the broad mandates of both NSIRA and NISCOP, um, there is a potential for overlap, especially in what they review for. So they could, they both could technically review issues related to efficacy, uh, issues related to compliance, uh, issues related to innovation of the agencies. Um, they're, they're geared toward different things. So for example, the parliamentarians has the diversity of expertise, so they would be very useful in reviewing legislation. Um, NSIRA is uh, made up, um, according to Bill C-59, of former CERC members, so they have the experience in accountability, uh, intelligence accountability, to look at things more geared to compliance. Um, however, there, there probably will need to be some kind of uh, delineating of responsibilities to prevent overlap and the, uh, the minimization of duplication of work. We also want to consider that every time one of these committees makes a request to the agencies, given that there's no new money to the agencies to support all these new requests, this is effect effectively a cut in the budgets to the agencies themselves. And so if we want to, we want to make sure that committees coordinate so that we also afford the agencies an, as efficient an opportunity to respond rather than having to provide very similar things to multiple committees. And I think the greatest payoff for the taxpayer and for parliamentarians and Canadians will be a clear division of labor among these entities based on particular areas of expertise that they bring to bear. And for the example for, the NS, uh, for, for NISCOP, the one clear advantage is now we finally have somebody who can advocate for changes in legislation because we know there are many pieces of flawed legislation. This government is addressing several of them in this parliamentary period and we finally now have, ad but these, they're never high enough when cabinet meets to actually make it on the cabinet agenda. And so for years we have had MCs to make changes that don't actually ever make it through cabinet. Now we actually have advocates, we have legislators, parliamentarians who can bring and make sure that the legislation is as effective as possible, both on the constitutionality, le legality side, and relative to a changing security environment. No, it's certainly a welcome development and a, an important one. Um, you have argued, Professor Leuprecht, in the past that uh, to meet the security challenges that Canada faces, uh, that we would, quote, need to improve professional skills development mechanisms to build the skill sets and recruit the skills uh, and recruit the skill sets into our national security organizations. So there's a lot about skill sets there. Are we doing that uh, well enough, in your view, currently? Um, there are agencies that do it better, and agencies that could st benefit from some improvement. I think we have. Uh, a very careful selection process um, and professional development process, for instance, among the Canadian Armed Forces, um, within the communication security establishment, to a large degree also within CSE, but we also know that on the law enforcement side, uh, there is considerable opportunity for improvement on capabilities, capacities, and skill sets. And so while I, for instance, respect the suggestions that CSIS should stick to its knitting and as far as possible basically have other agencies deal with particular issues. I would submit to you, yes, in the best, in, in the best of all worlds, we would want to have the RCMP do things like disruption or whatnot. But my submission to you is the RCMP is struggling on so many fronts already that I think we, we, we need to figure out also where the relative advantage of different organizations lies and allow them to break, get up to Thank speed. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Motts, please, seven minutes. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you uh, both groups for being here today. Uh, Mr. Luprick, you had said in previous testimony on Bill C-51 that CSIS is the most reviewed intelligence security service in the Western world, and therefore I think we can safely say in the world as it is. Um, in your reading of C-59, are there new layers or any new layers of, reviewed, of review placed on upon CSIS, and do you think those are helpful in helping CSIS fulfill its mandate? So, um, under the new legislation, the NCRA has a wider remit when it comes to reviewing um, Canadian intelligence and security agencies in general. Um, so they and they do have the potential under under different mandates to not only review for more but also help CSIS innovate in different ways. Um, so yes, they are reviewed to more extent. Sorry, I didn't catch the latter part of your question. And do you think that, uh, that those are helpful in, in um, CSIS fulfilling its mandate? Yeah, I definitely think that NCRA has a greater potential to um, enhance the compliance, the efficacy, and the innovation within CSIS. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Luprick, you also uh, indicated, uh, I, I guess the powers in C-51 provided CSIS with, um, they're not uncommon. So you had said in, in your testimony again on C-51 that uh, that Canadians have a profound misconception of what disruption constitutes. And CSIS uh, being able to talk to parents, tell them that their child is up to no good is a disruption power. So, and I can go on with that, but with the changes proposed in C-59, uh, particularly to securing a warrant to conduct certain disruption activities, do you believe we are heading in the right direction with this legislation on that particular front? I think the challenge is always in as I think also my colleagues pointed out, in reassuring Canadians that um, uh, the activity in which the service engages is compliant with the Constitution and the rule of law. And I think there is, while, while I am personally satisfied that the service engages with the utmost professionalism when it comes to the use of its disruption powers, uh, I think such a measure may be justified in some cases as a way to reassure Canadians that the expanded powers that CSIS has been given, and where there was controversy of whether these powers should reside with CSIS or with law enforcement, and I explained why I think, for better or for worse, they for the time being need to reside with CSIS, why um, uh, this, uh, why, why the warrant measures may be necessary to ensure the legitimacy and credibility of the uh, activities in which CSIS engages. All right. Um. May I have an opportunity to answer that oh, question? Oh, please. Um, so uh, we do feel that, that the, the scheme that's laid out in C-59, as, as we said, is an improvement uh, in terms of, of clarifying what the contours of threat disruption look like um, and, and making clear uh, to both the public and to the service itself what um, you know what the acceptable bounds are and what the, the prohibited bounds are. In particular, the addition of, um, uh, of, of prohibited activities, including detention, uh, was was in our view quite an important one. Um, and I, I do want to just reference that when we express concerns about disruption and concerns about why it is that this is not being done by law enforcement, some of that has to do with making sure that we can effectively prosecute people once we determine that they've done something uh, contrary to the law. The, the other thing is that um, we, we've never been particularly concerned about the kind of disruption that, that you mentioned, so talking to a parent and saying your, your child's been, been getting into some, some, um, some trouble. Um, we're more concerned with some of the items that are now specifically enumerated in the legislation, things like uh, fabricating or disseminating any information, record, or document, you know, altering or removing um, uh, websites and communications, things like that. So it's, it's helpful in our view to have that in the legislation, and we do have suggestions for how the warrant scheme might be improved, and, and we can elaborate on those more in our written submissions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dubrick, um, from your background in history and working in, this, in cybersecurity, are there steps that we need to be, to be taken to protect our critical infrastructure? And does restricting um, CSEC to reacting to significant and widespread threats help Canada or delay our ability to respond? So look, I, I think the, the government's proposed establishment of an act 
for CSE itself is a huge improvement in innovation over the current situation within the, where it is embedded in the National Defense Act. I would say that on cybersecurity in this country, by and large, not only do we have our head in the sand, um, we need to do much better at especially the intelligence sharing, so the, 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 uh, the, the, the CCTX, the new um, mechanism to exchange cyber intelligence is I think a good improvement here. One of the challenges that we have had is that CSE is by law extremely restricted as to what it can share and under what in conditions it can share with the private sector. And in this area, you ultimately need to prevent and anticipate and effective and timely intelligence sharing, given how quickly cyber challenges and threats move, they are integral. Other countries are much further ahead. If you look at Australia, the Netherlands, Israel, the United Kingdom, this is what's sometimes known as phase two. If we cannot effectively protect our cyber infrastructure, that is going to have a deleterious consequence for our economy, because people will only invest in innovation, in R&D, in the Canadian economy, if those elements are then also protected, because why would you invest if that's going to be immediately stolen? And so I think for the sake, and, and we know that this country has done particularly poorly on the innovation agenda, and luckily this government is trying to improve Canada's innovation capacity, um, that will not be effective if we can't then also ensure that the cyber domain uh, is, effectively, um, is effectively protected. Sorry, Mr. But Chair, may I have an opportunity to respond to that question as well? I just have, I have 30 seconds. I have one more question I do want to respond to, sorry. Uh, Bill C-59, as we've heard from the Justice Department, will make it more difficult for law enforcement to secure preventative arrests. Now, because of the threshold is being raised uh, to secure such an order, uh, do you, Mr. Lubrecht, consider this to be problematic? Answer to that uh, question because we've just run out of time. Can we? Can you provide that to us uh, to the committee uh, in, in writing, if you could, to, to that question? Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Dubé. Seven minutes, please. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. I don't know if you wanted to answer that question because I'm coming to the cybersecurity stuff as well. I would love to. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the question was um, about how the how Canada's cybersecurity can be improved, and I would like to draw the committee's attention to um, the active and defensive cyber operations aspects of CSE's mandate that have been added in sections 20 and 19, respectively. Uh, it's our position that um, the inclusion of these two aspects and the activities that come along with it may actually run counter to Canada's broader security interests. And I would draw the committee's attention to, uh, in particular, the short list of prohibited conduct in Section 33. And I think there are three, at least three fundamental problems with that section. Um, the first issue is that for reasons which are not clear to us, the explicit limitations for prohibited conduct only apply to authorizations issued under the defensive and active cyber operations component of the mandate and not the rest of CSE's activities. The, section, uh, the second issue is that neither justice nor democracy are defined in the act, leaving the limitation about interfering with the course of justice and democracy uh, vague and open to perhaps creative interpretation. The third problem um, is that this short list of prohibited conduct from our perspective is, is radically under-inclusive and at minimum the committee should compare the list um, with that in the CSIS Act in 21.1 uh, 1 .1, with that in 33.1. Uh, and so we, we are concerned about the broad scope of potential activities that CSE would be able to conduct under these aspects of the mandate and we're not uh, convinced that they've been uh, appropriately justified. Thank you for that. I want to stay in part three of the bill actually as well and look at specifically uh, um, section 24. And I don't, and I'm, I'm open to hear from everyone, but in particular from, from you, uh, Ms. Gill, I wanted to, you mentioned um, encryption software, so some of the applications that are used uh, and often not just used by uh, so called uh, bad guys, but also by uh, people, Canadians, law-abiding Canadians seeking to protect their privacy. In the course of, in particular, B and C, where we're talking about essentially testing and studying information infrastructure and evaluating software and testing them for vulnerabilities, does, does that potentially create a, a situation where we can go down that rabbit hole and find ways to counter some encryption that can be used for, for lawful purposes of simply having the peace of mind of protecting your privacy? for that question. Um, certainly, we know that um, allied intelligence agencies have engaged in the past in activities meant to interfere or undermine encryption and anonymity tools. Um, 
and I think that uh, we should be concerned about those types of operations, not just in the course of the testing and infrastructure information aspects under 24, uh, but more generally in the pursuit of the, um, the foreign intelligence mandate. Um, encryption and anonymity tools are vital to protecting the safety of uh, Canadians uh, and persons in Canada, as well as uh, Canadian infrastructure. And so we should be concerned uh, if the CSE ends up uh, you know, inadvertently working at cross purposes by interfering with the very tools designed to protect us. Um, I would also raise, uh, and this is something that's been uh, raised in the past, is that there's no uh, framework, uh, uh, public framework for um, disclosing vulnerabilities, uh, and that is an issue that uh, while CCLA doesn't have a, a concrete position on yet, it is an open issue from our perspective. And when you say disclosing vulnerabilities, you mean CSC disclosing those to, say, the private sector, so for example, uh, a telecom company. Right, yeah, responsible disclosure to ensure that where CSE um, finds vulnerabilities uh, and where it's appropriate and, you know, in the public interest to do so that they are disclosed responsibly in order to protect uh, privacy interests and as well as expression interests. You know, this is not just about privacy rights. Um, of course, uh, these types of technologies are digital. Uh, ecosystem is an important guarantor of the right to freedom of expression protected under Section 2B of the Charter, as well as broader interests of, of security and liberty that I think uh, you know all Canadians in this committee is, is very concerned about. I also just wanted to look at uh, 24.4 as well, information acquired incidentally. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, uh, where it says the establishment may acquire information relating to a Canadian or a person in Canada incidentally in the course of carrying out activities under an authorization issued under and then listing the appropriate subsections. Um, it, it, especially in the context of information sharing, is there any concern with that type of provision? Yeah, that's something that we hope to detail uh, in our written submission more explicitly. We are concerned. Um, we are concerned about that. Uh, the words incidentally are defined, but the limitation of not directing is not defined anywhere in the Act, and that's a concern that experts, uh, including Bill Robinson, has raised in the past, um, which would help uh, better define the contours of what we mean. And, and certainly, to the extent that CSE engages in unselected bulk collection, um, you know, there there will be in incidental collection of Canadian Canadian data, and we do have to make sure that measures, uh, you know, explicit, clear, and detailed measures are taken to ensure that that information is handled responsibly where collected. Okay, and my last question on, on part three would be, uh, concerning the, the the number, there's many uh, sections dealing with authorizations, ministerial authorizations. I don't know if there's any thoughts on that. In particular, one aspect is the extension of the period of valid, valid validity, excuse me, um, without um, being subject to review by the commissioner that's being created by this mm -hmm. very same bill. Yeah, we are concerned about the ability to uh, extend by the one-year period, but we do think that it's important that where there's a significant change in the scope of the authorization that that's brought to the commissioners in, um, in attention, so we think that's important. We would want to also raise that the authorization framework for active and defensive cyber operations is extremely problematic from our view insofar as those operations have the capacity to significantly interfere with expressive privacy security interests of Canadians and persons in Canada and persons elsewhere. Uh, we don't believe that ministerial authorization w through the Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs is uh, sufficient and we would uh, prefer to analogize these types of powers to uh, the disruption powers or the threat reduction powers in the CSIS Act um, and note that there is a, a much more rigorous system for for oversight and prior authorization uh, in that context. I would also note that if the committee um, decided not to adopt these aspects of the CSE Act, um, which allowed CSE to engage in active and cyber, um, defensive cyber operations unbound from other aspects of its mandate, uh, CSIS, uh, CSE could continue to assist CSIS through its assistance mandate in the course of threat reduction activities. Thank so you. judicial oversight, essentially. Uh, that'll be detailed in our written submissions. Okay. For now, what I feel comfortable putting on the record is that we are not comfortable with ministerial authorization alone. Thank you. Thank you. This is Damoff, seven minutes. Thank you, Chair. And um, just before I, I start, I actually have a student shadowing me today, and I just wanted to recognize Ian Lewis, who, who is here. He's a student here in Ottawa, and I think it's uh, wonderful that he's taken an interest in what the national security framework in this legislation is looking at. So. Um, 
during our previous study on the national security framework there was a lot of desire on the part of canadians for greater transparency from the intelligence and security agencies we also heard that when we were looking at bill c twenty two a witness we heard from at the last meeting doctor stephanie carbon was actually quite passionate about calling for better transparency and she actually cited a couple of models to look at one was the u s office of the national director of national intelligence worldwide threat assessment report as well as the recent report on cyber threats to canada's election system and direct demand democratic institutions by the communication security establishment and i'm just wondering if perhaps both of you could comment on that and if you see that as being something that should be included in the the legislation that we're looking at or if it's something that would be looked at more through regulation or through ministerial directive that the ncr provides a greater transparency because they have um... several different types of reports including annual reports and agency specific reports that they must submit to parliament back off the microphone just slightly please thank you so they have a number of reports that are going to parliament which parliamentarians as public representatives of people can read and analyze and speak about i think that really will speak a lot to enhancing transparency i know that that the agencies themselves specifically csc and the uh... accountability existing accountability bodies have made a kind of publicity push to get people knowing uh... what they do and how they do it and kind of giving them more information regarding that so just before we move on i when she was here she was talking specifically about the u s report where it deals with specific threats so it outlines the number of threats and and so it was very it was very specific on on uh... threats within the united states um, which is a little different than i think the reports that will be getting to parliament right now i think there there is a need for demystification because of course our adversaries play actively in this environment on a permanent basis cyber is the single greatest threat to our national security to our democracy our social harmony and our prosperity today and so um, i think there is opportunity here to be more systematic in how we communicate that to canadians but also where we currently don't do particularly well is small and medium-sized enterprise large enterprise can has the capacity, small and medium-sized enterprise, the people who generate much of our prosperity, our innovation, and much of the employment in this country, currently do not have access to those tools. And I think any mechanism that the government can, um, can agree upon to inform uh, people better and give, for instance, organizations such as CSE more capacity to support uh, small and medium-sized enterprise would be, uh, would be critical. Okay, and I think a report you. is one effort to that effect. And did you have any comment on that? Thank you. Yes, thank you. I mean, I think that in general, the CCLA would share Professor Carvin's passion for the concept of transparency. Um, in relation to the U.S. report on specific threats, one of the things we often hear as a civil liberties organization when we make comments that are perceived to be idealistic about national security and accountability is that we don't understand what's really going on. A report such as you're referring to, which actually shares with all Canadians the nature of real and existing threats, would provide, I think, an important framework for every Canadian and every civil society group to be able to make more rational assessments in relation to these kinds of analyses and processes that we're going through today, and enhance public trust that, you know, that things are happening as they should, that risks are real and that we therefore have the clear and specific procedures enacted in legislation to deal with the kinds of threats that we're legitimately facing. Thank you very much. Um, the, the next question I had to, to ask has to do with um, the minister's testimony when he was here before this committee on Bill C-59. And when we were ta he was talking about the changes from Bill C-51 um, amending, um, advocating, and promoting the commission of terrorism offenses in general, um, and sorry, and adding um, 
replacing it, the offense to apply only where a person specifically counsels another person to commit a terrorism offense, and, and it provides a clear and more appropriate legal structure surrounding them. So, so th uh, when he was questioned, he was asked um, if this would provide law enforcement with actually better tools to be able to enforce. Um, now, you had mentioned something about you thought that the definition was still too broad. Um, so. I guess my first question is, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see what the minister was saying in terms of it actually narrowing the definition to allow law enforcement to enforce, um, but then I'd also welcome comments from both of you on, on that. Um, I, I didn't have the opportunity to see all of the, the minister's testimony, but I do know that, and, and we do uh, agree that this is an improvement in terms of narrowing uh, the offense considerably. Um, it, in our view, it's still arguably unnecessary since counseling any offense that's already an offense under the criminal code is is already an offense um, and so it's not exactly clear what this what this offense is doing the fact that it it references terrorism offenses which is not actually a defined term in the code um, makes me think that there may be some interest in being able to prosecute someone for counseling without having to specify which terrorism offense in particular they were counseling, um, uh, which is potentially problematic from a rule of law perspective in terms of someone understanding what it is they're, they're charged with and, and where the bounds of the law are. Um, but the, the terrorism, the list of terrorist activity in the code, and that's the language we think should be inserted into that provision, um, is, is quite a long list, and it does include a number of things that that fall, um, you know, well beyond any acts of violence. That things that are that are participating, that may be facilitating terrorist activity, uh, and so, um, you know, we, we think it could be it could be sharpened and clarified by making that amendment. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Leach. We're down to about three minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for taking the time to come today. Um, Mr. Lightfoot, I'd like to ask you um, one particular question. I guess in follow-up to your comment about how Canada no longer lives in an isolated part of the world with respect to these issues around uh, uh, security, um, Bill C-59, we've heard from the Justice Department, um, will make it more difficult for law enforcement to secure preventative arrests. Um, because the threshold is being raised to secure such an order, I was wondering if you could make some comments with respect to that and your perspective on it. The challenge in that space is that you ultimately have to be preventative, and different countries have different mechanisms. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission has fantastic mechanisms that work very well in this particular sphere. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the reduction of the ability to work in a preventative space. I'm also, and this ties in with the previous question, deeply concerned that we have upwards of 120 Canadians who have returned to this country, some of whom have pillaged raped, killed, and are able to return to this country and live here with impunity because we do not have the legislative instruments to bring them to justice. And to that effect, um, it's, it's helpful to have some changes with the criminal code, but we need other offenses, including offenses, for instance, that make it illegal to travel to certain parts of the world, which has proven a very effective measure in Australia to prosecute people who engage in this type of activity. So, yeah, I think we're we're tinkering at the edges here when it comes to preventive arrest and when it comes to how exactly we define it to hopefully make it more effective for law enforcement to use the tools that we have, but I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. Now, uh, maybe I could ask all of you a, a, another question. In your reading of Bill C-59, um, each of you have made some comments with regards to the number of layers and um, whether or not there will be new reviews placed on CSIS and their capacity to be able to do things. Do you think that it's helpful in allowing CSIS to meet its mandate and having these additional layers? You had commented, uh, Mr. Leiprick, with regards to the issues around methodology and how that would be implemented. Could you make a comment and then we'll come back to the others? I think that in order to allow CSIS to complete their mandate while making the most of their resources and time that the Committee of Parliamentarians and the review agency should coordinate on how they get information from CSIS, whether it's through their parliamentary liaison, um, just to save time and not so much burden on, on the agencies. And there is a cost to every layer of review and oversight that we impose on agencies 
and without additional funding in a democracy, we need to weigh the trade-offs in which we engage. But there are, as we have mentioned, potentially quite positive outcomes, especially in terms of eff efficacy and innovation uh, for the community itself as a result of the work that will be done. Thank you, uh, Ms. Leach. And uh, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank, thank all of you much. for your uh, contributions. And we look forward to uh, receipt of your uh, further submissions as, uh, as may be required. With that, we'll adjourn. Thank you very much.